Bibles this morning to Acts chapter 4, and you're getting an outline that's passed out to you at this time. Momentum, our second week on church growth study. I, uh, as I said last week, I want our church to grow. God wants his church to grow. And so we have our vision, our campaign for these next two years now. We want to be thinking about in our, our view of momentum to uh, be able to look at the things that are necessary for us to do the work that gets us to grow. Now, I, I want you to understand, before we go any further, that of all the methodology, of all the effort of human intuition and create, creativity and innovation, that it is God that gives the growth. We sow the seed, we water the seed, but it's God that gives the increase. But we must be doing the things that facilitate for God to work. We must be ready to be the channel of blessing for other people in this world. The reason why we are interested in, in church growth is because God is interested in church growth. And that's how we ended last week's lesson. Is that God wanted his church to go. He wants his church to grow. He wants his church to glow. And we need to want what God wants. He gave his one and only son for the whole world, not just for a few. And he's not willing that any should perish, that it all come to repentance. And that's why we're here today talking about church growth. How are you and I a part of the church growth plan that God has for the Blackwell Church of Christ? So in Acts chapter 4, we're going to start there. We have studied this text recently, at least two or three times this year already. I have focused on this text. And I love coming back to this because it's the believer's prayer in the early church in the first century as the church has gotten started and as they're picking up some momentum. Now the momentum that they're picking up is a result of the resistance that they're also facing. And we need to understand, my mom told me this other night, she said, Lanny, you're talking about church growth, but you need to realize that when you're talking about church growth and the church starts growing, Satan gets busier. And I think that's good advice. It is in the face of resistance that the church grows. Not everybody is going to be accepting of our challenges. Not everybody is going to be comfortable with what you and I are talking about. As was mentioned in our class this morning, we follow Jesus, a man who probably was, he, he was the master of relationships. Uh, if anybody could win friends and influence people, Jesus could. And yet not everybody liked Jesus. We follow him. He went to a cross. Jesus says we have a cross to carry as well. But I want us to start looking at this prayer again, just a part of it, the believer's prayer, beginning in verse 29. After they have expressed their gratefulness to, to God, they say this, verse 29, Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. It goes on to say, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. And I want to start there this morning because what we're looking at this morning is we're going to do a little bit of comparison, a contrast, if you will, of our traditional model of growth that we have pretty much depended on, or, or placed a lot of emphasis on in 
the past several years within Churches of Christ, but I want to put that up against the backdrop of the Acts model of how they grew. And one of the things I want to point out, and I think this is true of both the traditional model and the Acts model, prayer plays an important part in whatever model you choose. I don't know if the, if the disciples at this point in time had an attendance goal like you and I have for our church here, 220 by 2020. I don't know if they thought about numbers per se as a goal or as a marker, but they did say, here's what we need for us to be the kind of people, use us in this way, help us in this way, give us what we're asking for so that we can help further your cause. And that was the main objective, was to get the word of God preached to all nations. That was the great commission Jesus left for his followers to follow. And so when we're looking at this chapter then, uh, or, or this particular prayer, Three things that I'm going to observe with you, and I'm kind of giving you the points kind of ahead of time, and then we're going to expound into them as we look at the examples of what I'm talking about. So here we are on our path forward in our momentum study. The first thing that I must say to you is our prayers must be bold. No more puny prayers. Okay? We need challenging we need daring, we need visionary prayers. That's what this prayer was. And not only are they praying for boldness, this is a bold prayer. As was stated a few weeks ago in the sermon that I had used this as the main text, we studied the prayer in its entirety. One of the things I mentioned to you was, this came off the fact that Peter and John had just got their hands slapped for preaching Jesus in the streets of Jerusalem. And this prayer does not go, Jesus, please keep us out of trouble, keep the resistance away, and help us to know better. This was really more of a prayer of, help us to keep doing what we've just been doing and to do it even more and to more boldly do it. To be fearless in our faith. This is a bold prayer to pray. I know I probably mentioned this either on Wednesday nights or perhaps on Sunday morning. That if you were to study any book of the Bible that would be a good example of church growth, is I would actually pick the book of Nehemiah out of the Old Testament and rebuilding the walls. Because in that text of Nehemiah, you're going to go through a people that got together, picked up momentum to get the wall built in the face of resistance. And about every other chapter, if you were to do a synopsis of that book, there's a prayer inserted there somewhere, a bold prayer to move forward, a bold prayer to go before your king, to get the permission, to get the financing, as Nehemiah did and demonstrated in chapter 1 of that book. And they have a willingness to work, even at the point that when they had resistance, they had to, they had to have a tool in one hand and a weapon in another. But they moved forward. They had a path forward that was bold. And I believe it's because, I believe it is a result of what Nehemiah prayed for and the wall got rebuilt and God got glorified. And I believe that the church grows at an exponential rate from this point forward because of this specific prayer in Acts 4 that was bold. We need to pray bold prayers like the early disciples did. Number two, our story must be told. The thing they're praying for is that they preach the word of God more boldly, that they tell the story, the story that's fresh on their minds and their hearts, that Jesus came, we saw him, we touched him, we heard him, we saw the things he did, and it affected us, and what affected us is infecting us, and we want to pass that on, we want to share that, we've got a story to tell, our God is still alive, amen? Amen. Jesus is still King of kings, Lord of lords, amen? He is still that powerful. Jesus is still worth telling and sharing. We need to go tell people about Jesus. And the third thing that I would point out is our faith must be sold. Now I'm using this in an accommodating way. I don't mean to sell out your faith. I mean you've got a product that is worth telling others about. A product that you yourself should be sold on. I hate going to somebody buying a product for them when they don't own it themselves. You ever been to the Chevy house and the car dealer is driving a Ford? Something wrong with that. 
We need to make sure that when we're telling the story, that the people that are hearing us tell the story also know that we're sold on the product of Jesus. Let's sell the church to people. Not sell a building, not, not, not peddle things, but let's, let's share, let's make sure that people see that we're sold out for Jesus. We're sold out for God. Our faith must be sold. They need to see that when you're telling the story, they'll look and see that you're living the story. Kind of goes back to last week's go, grow, and glow. You need to be shining like Jesus. As shine like stars as you hold out the word of life as Paul wrote in the book of Philippians. Our prayers must be bold. Our story must be told. Our faith must be sold. We've got something worth sharing, something worth giving, something that we must go out into the world with. I want to look at our traditional model of church growth through the years as I have observed it. Uh, the, the, the traditional model that I have been accustomed to, and I'm sure most of you raised in the church probably have been accustomed to this. One of the, uh, and we're talking evangelism, by the way. We're talking about how do we reach, how do we do outreach. And the traditional model basically has been, over the years, let's conduct gospel meetings. And they used to be, believe it or not, two weeks long. How many of you remember when gospel meetings were longer than they are now? How many of you remember gospel meetings? Okay, just very few remember the gospel meetings, right? And I grew up, probably most of the gospel meetings I grew up attending or I was a part of was a week long. How many of you remember a week long gospel meeting? And then we, they went to what? Three day meetings. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, maybe four day meetings. And sometimes you'll hear of just a, a two or three day meeting if you hear of any. There are gospel meetings. Now, I'm not saying they are ineffective, but that is a model that I was used to growing up. And along with that was maybe door knocking campaigns preceding the meeting, and we'd go around, and usually the door knocking, even though we were going from house to house knocking on doors, it was usually come to the meeting, come to the VBS, come to whatever event, the fish fry, or whatever it is that we have at our church building, come to this, come to that. Keep that in mind. Uh, here, here we've had a fair booth at the county fair. In the month of September, we'd go down and we'd pass out literature and we'd try to share about uh, events that might be coming up and we'd try to get people to come over to our booth and pick up literature, maybe take it away and hopefully it got home with them instead of into the trash barrel that was just, you know, two booths down. And that's been a, something that we've tried. Uh, church tracks in the, of themselves. About every church building you ever go to will have a track rack. Some people have no idea what it is, but you've walked by it every Sunday that you've been here, and we have one in our foyer, and several tracks that may answer questions. Were there really dinosaurs, or uh, evolution versus creation, or maybe it's something about uh, uh, issues, you know, moral issues, and uh, so that has been a way that we have tried to do evangelism. Uh, we have done uh, a radio and TV ministry, which is good. Again, a lot of that is based on come to the church here, come, come tune into our radio. Uh, uh, anybody can choose to, to select the radio or the TV channel uh, and listen to us, but they have a whole uh, array of choices, you know, and so much more choices now to tune in or to uh, select the channel for uh, than just what we might be offering there. So that, that has been our traditional model, and it's usually... Uh, let's have a big event and try to get as many people as we can, even with our friend day that we're planning on uh, to have later on in the year, which is a good thing. And I want y'all to be thinking about a friend day, okay? Inviting people to be here and have a, an, an, an attendance goal and meeting that goal. That'd be awesome. That'd be energetic. But it is usually driven towards come here to this or come here for that. So keep that in mind. It's comfortable. Uh, we can easily pick up the phone or we can talk to our neighbor at the coffee shop or at the, across the fence of the backyard. It's convenient. And it's sometimes complacent. I don't have to do any more than I have to. At least I'll invite somebody. I've invited so-and-so many times and several times they've turned me down, but I'll invite them one more time. It's a come approach. Now I want us to look at the Acts model. And for this, we're going to look at a few verses. And this is on your worksheet, so take a look and make any notes that you want to. But I want to move on to the next chapter of Acts, Acts chapter 5, beginning in verse 17. 
Then the high priest and all his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. And this is what the angel said, verse 20. Go, stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people the full message of this new life. Go, stand in the temple courts, he said. Then you move on to chapter 8, beginning in verse 4. And it says, Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. With shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Move on down to verse 12. But when they believed Philip as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of the Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. Now, same chapter, move on down to verse 25. When they had testified and proclaimed the word of the Lord, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out and on his way he met the Ethiopian eunuch, an important official. You probably have been familiar with this story. If you go on down to verse 34, you'll see the result. The eunuch asked Philip, please tell me who the prophet's talking about, himself or someone else. Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. And as they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here's water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about, preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Now we're going to move to chapter 10. Keep looking for the similarities of these stories in, in Acts chapter 10, beginning in verse 19. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? And this is, of course, being taken to Cornelius' household where he gets to preach Jesus to Cornelius and the result we find in verse 47. Can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have, so he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. And now chapter 16. It's a kind of a, a scripture blitz. I understand that. But there is a point to be made as we go through these. Acts chapter 16, verse 13. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house, and she persuaded us. So we have that story. In verse 16, once we were going to the place of prayer, we were, we were met by a slave girl who had, had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. Uh, again, they, they deal with her give her the message they need to give her, but again, it's because they were going to these different places. Also in Acts chapter 16, take a look now with me at verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. By the way, they're in prison now. Again, something the disciples were in um, prison for was for preaching Jesus publicly, and it was not met with full acceptance. And this is that occasion again. They are singing and praying. It's midnight. This is the story of where the earthquake takes place and the jailer is about to kill himself. And Paul says, don't do yourself any harm. And he asks this question in verse 30. What must I do to be saved? 
And they say in verse 31, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in the house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds and immediately he and all his family were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole family. And then one more, chapter 22, as Paul is telling of his own conversion, that in particular involved a disciple named Ananias. And it's in Acts 22, beginning in verse 12. A man named Ananias came to see me. Remember, Ananias had been approached by God and said, you need to go talk to this guy named Saul. And Ananias was a little hesitant. Haven't you heard about what he's doing? He's been persecuting Christians. And God revealed to him, I've chosen him to be an instrument of the gospel among the Gentiles. Well, here is Paul's telling this story in verse 12. A man came, a man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law, highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. Then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all men of what you have, been, what you have seen and heard. And now, what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. And as we know, Saul converted from being a persecutor of Christians to be a con being a converter of lost souls. One more thing I want to mention in the, uh, in the midst of these passages that I have written down for you are the examples of both Jesus and the early Christians the example of a, a mode of operation that you can observe through scriptures of when they went to a town, they would go directly to a synagogue and preach. Uh, Jesus did this in Mark 1, verse 21, John 6, tw uh, 29. But we also see this is an example of what the early disciples did. Paul did this. As a matter of fact, if you would allow me, uh, indulge me with one more passage here from Acts chapter 17. There are several mentions of this where Paul when he'd go to a city for the first time, he'd go directly to where the people were. In Acts chapter 17, we find this in verse 2. Acts 17, 2. And I'll go ahead and back up to verse 1. When they had passed through Amphipolis in Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a Jewish synagogue. As his custom was, Paul went into the synagogue and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Christ, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, and as, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks, and not a few prominent women. This is just one of many examples in the book of Acts. You've got Acts 9, Acts 14, Acts 19, where you have examples of the Apostle Paul or some of the other Christians going into the synagogue. Now, with these passages in mind, I want you to think about something. Consider with me what is a common denominator in these examples as a model of evangelism. I know that many would point to the fact, well, these are the conversion stories. These are where they went and preached the gospel and people obeyed the gospel, and that's true. These are the examples where we can find that baptism was an end result, and after, after that, they were filled with joy, and that's true. These are examples of conversions that we have in Acts. And I will say this too, and I know that many of you recognize this, that in our religious world today, even in Christendom, maybe what we see from the biblical example is not necessarily what you hear on the TV or here on a radio, or what you'd go inside to a church building when you're talking about being saved, getting saved, or being converted at all, sometimes baptism is not mentioned. In the Acts model, that's what we're seeing. We're seeing men and women who are having their hearts opened by God to believe in Jesus as being Son of God. They're being called on to confess. They're being called on to repent. And they're being called on to call on the name of the Lord Jesus. And what Paul says, and that's what I did by being baptized. I was calling on the name of the Lord. That's what Ananias told me as he's telling that story in Acts 22 when Ananias said, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, calling on the name of the Lord. It's a participle 
phrase to, to describe the action that he was to take. And it's a result of what we see in Acts chapter 2, in the very first day of the church. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? For the forgiveness of your sins. And 3,000 people did. In the next chapter, we know that that grew to be 5,000. And it keeps growing and growing. We saw in Acts chapter 6, verse 7, that the growth of the early church was rapid. It increased rapidly. And it seemed the more havoc you had, the more resistance or the more persecution. Irony, even at the hands of the Apostle Paul, when you see the stoning of Stephen and Paul is there, he's known as Saul in the text, his Jewish name. He's gathering the coats as people are picking up rocks to stone Stephen to death. And the very next chapter says the church started growing. It started moving. People went everywhere. If you're looking at the Acts model, it was to the streets. It was to the synagogues. It was by the riversides where there were known places of prayer. It was on the road as you're traveling. It was going wherever God wanted you to go where people were that needed to hear Jesus. It was in people's homes. That would be the common denominator. Now, let's take a step back and kind of compare the two. If you look at the traditional model we've had, we conduct and hold events here, invite people here, and we're going to continue doing that. But if that's all we're going to be doing, we are missing out on a model that was working for the early church. Now, I'm not going to have you say amen to this, but I'd like to maybe ask for a nod of your head if you recognize that. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? That as you contrast the two... Our traditional model, a convenient way and comfortable way, is come to this, come to that, come to where we are. And the Acts model really is more of a go to where the people are. Do you see that? Yes? And this means no. Do you see that? Or just nodding to sleep. I had a guy that told me one time as he was preaching, the more you nod off going to sleep, that just means... You're agreeing with me, I'll preach even longer. I want you to understand that there is a very stark contrast. Now, I, I understand some of you may think, okay, but, you know, you mentioned door knocking and going to the fair booth, and that is, a, that is true, that's going, but usually those are precursors to come to our event. It's not really confronting with care at their door, but it's to invite them to something. Now I know that this is not popular, but I, there's data to back this up. There are still religious movements today that are doing door knocking. Okay? Have, has your door been knocked on in the last year? Let's see a show of hands. If your door's been knocked on. Okay? And the Jehovah's Witnesses are the best at that method. I ask you a question. Are Jehovah's Witnesses growing or dying? Google it. They're growing. Even in Churches of Christ... The We Care Ministries that was started by Larry West, kind of based out of the Whites Ferry Road Church in West Monroe, Louisiana, they still to this day travel from churches uh, all over the country. They, get, they go to churches helping the church construct a door-knocking campaign, a soul-winning campaign, and they're still showing signs of success. Whenever that's brought up, if you have the reaction like I do... <laughs> You want to run to the hills when somebody mentions, let's go door knocking. How many of you are with me? Why? It's not convenient. It's not comfortable. And nobody likes to be shoved off. I'm not interested. And to go knocking on doors only to have People close their doors, slam their doors in my face if that's ever occurred. It has occurred. Or just to say we're not interested. You feel that rejection. And you don't want to feel that. 
I don't want to feel that either. That's inconvenient for me to go knowing that I may not get many results. I'm here to tell you that the difference in a growing church today and a dying church today is whether or not its members are willing to do the inconvenient, uncomfortable thing. It's not just about door knocking, it's about any effort at all besides coming to church hoping that maybe somebody will join me when I'm here. It had just been two or three Sundays ago, I talked about we need more exposure, not enclosure. The gospel needs to go beyond brick and mortar. The gospel needs to go into your workplace. The gospel needs to go where you go to school. The gospel needs to travel with you when you're on the highway. The gospel needs to be with you when you take a break and you stop for gas and for restroom and for drinks. The gospel needs to go with you everywhere you go. When you look at the model in Acts, yes, inconvenient, yes, uncomfortable, but it was a go mentality for these early Christians. And the result was they grew. And as long as we're comfortable with the come mentality, we'll die. That's a fact. I'm going to go. I was just thinking somebody in their mind might be saying, please do. <laughs> I am going to go. And when I go, I'm taking the gospel with me wherever I go. I'm asking you to go. I'm asking. We have a town. Demographically, it says it on paper. It's hard to believe. But there's 7,000 people. How many households were there? Like 3,000 when we did that? 3,300 homes. We've got some places to go. And not just Blackwell. Members of this church live in Bremen. Deer Creek, Lamont, Narden, South Haven, Ponca City, Tonkawa. I always hate starting this list because somebody's going to say, you left me out, Newkirk. And whatever ever place I have missed from the members here, just mentally fill in that blank, okay? Do you have a place to go with the gospel? The answer is yes. We need to do what is uncomfortable. We need to do the inconvenient. We need this place filling up. And it's not efficient just to say, well, we've hired you to do that. Or just a few of you to do that. When we see the Acts model, everybody's doing that. And sometimes we look at Acts and say, oh, that's the model for how we should do mission work. And when Jesus talked about going to all the world, we talk about that in October. And yes, I put my money in on Mission Sunday. And I'm doing my part. And praise God that you are. But please remember something. Acts is not just about missions that are foreign. It's also about going to places where you're at. Sharing your faith. From now on, our elders, our ministry staff, we're looking at ways in which we won't just depend on a traditional model of come to this, come to that, but how we can challenge ourselves to go where the people are, possibly going to Bremen and having a pop-up worship service, doing door knocking in Narden. And somebody says, well, if we're going to do that there, why don't we do that here? And there are places, I can guarantee you, there are people in this town that have not yet either come here, much less been invited to come here. Let's do the come, but let's go. Let's do what's uncomfortable. Let's do the inconvenient. Which path do you think Jesus recommended? Did Jesus say, go build your church and then put the word out to have everybody come to where you're at? He did not say that, did he? He did not say that. We will know in the next two years whether we become a go church or a come church. I hope we can all say we've been going. Because it's exactly what Jesus instructed his early disciples to do. Go. 
go. Are you going to go? We're going to sing a song, and this is to encourage you to respond if you feel like there's something in your, in your path that's keeping you from going, to get that out of the way. Let's pray a bold prayer about that and say, God, let's remove the obstacle, whatever it is that's keeping us from sharing our faith, from having a story to be told. And let's pray those bold prayers. If there's an obstacle in the way, if there's a problem in your life that needs to be taken care of first, let's get to that, take care of it, and get to be busy with what God wants us to be busy with. And let's step out of our comfort zone. Let's do the things that are inconvenient because there are people that might just go to hell if we don't. People will miss out on the good news of Jesus Christ when we stay where it's convenient and where it's comfortable and we become complacent. Let's change that. Let's become the growing church God destined us to be. Won't you come as we stand and sing?